Good evening. Welcome to UT Brainstorms. My name is Mike Mock. I'm a professor in the Department of Neuroscience at UT Austin. And our department sponsors UT Brainstorms as a way for us to share our passion about neuroscience research, neuroscience in general, and the way they affect our health and our, our, our daily lives. Uh, Brainstorms is intended to be a conversation. We share what we know, and then we learn from you, from the questions that you ask uh, and in the way that we uh, answer them. Uh, as always, we want to thank uh, Laura Anian and Elena Silva, the two UT uh, members who uh, work so hard to get everything organized for Brainstorms. They've won a, they won a, a awards for doing this, so thank you to Laura and Elena. We should also uh, all send some positive vibes. Laura's dog Ram Ramona is uh, sick in the host doggy hospital tonight, so good vibes to Ramona. So this is Brainstorms 31. It's our sixth uh, in the YouTube format in our fourth season. And I just wanna, uh, as a reminder, uh, you can see video of all but the first couple of previous Brainstorms by either going to UT Brainstorms channel on YouTube, uh, or you can go to utbrainstorms.com where you can click links to those same videos and where you can see the, the the list of upcoming uh, brainstorms. So the format, as always, is uh, our speaker will present, and then uh, when she's done, uh, we'll introduce the panelists, and then the speaker and the panelists will answer your questions. Uh, you ask your questions by typing them into the into the YouTube uh, chat. Uh, feel free to start uh, typing those in, even even as uh, the speaker is. Uh, working. Uh, it helps the panelists to see the questions. So anytime uh, for questions. And just as a reminder, questions are, are the key. Uh, it's what makes this whole thing work for, for both you and for us. So much so that feel free to contact me at, uh, if you have questions that weren't answered tonight. Um, my email address is mock, M-A-U-K, at utexas.edu. So uh, our speaker will introduce uh, her panelists, but it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker tonight, Dr. Mickey Marinelli. Uh, Mickey is an associate professor in the Department of Neuroscience. She's one of our best. She's, uh, she studies addiction. She's a part of our world-renowned uh, addiction uh, research uh, center, the Wagoner Center for Alcohol and uh, Addiction Research. Uh, she, uh, She's made great contributions in that field. She's also, uh, she teaches a very important class for us. She teaches a class about the sorts of things that we're gonna hear about tonight. She, about uh, fallacies and, and how scientists have to learn to think like scientists. And that's what she's gonna talk about us tonight. So please join me in this crazy virtual format in welcoming tonight's speaker, Dr. Mickey uh, Marinelli. Hi everyone. Thank you for being here. Today, I'm really happy to be sharing you one of my passions, which is about the fallacies of research and of science in general. So how we are easily fooled and when misled when processing information and making decisions. So we hear so much nowadays on the news, drink coffee before your workout for better results. Drinking three to four cups of coffee a day could lead to a longer life, new study suggests. Daily coffee tied to lower risk for heart failure. And then your daily cups of coffee can lower your risk for prostate cancer. And then there's the equivalent for the female, does coffee cut breast cancer risk, but then you find also it's opposite. Seven ways coffees is bad for you and your skin. And we are bombarded with all these different news all the time. So how do we know what's true? And once we get these news, we tend to broadcast it and it starts going over and over and, and gets spread out in, in the world. And again, is it real? Is it not real? How do we know? So I wanted to show you how at least 
data gets from a scientist up to you know, being broadcasted. So a scientist like me creates science, does an experiment. It takes a long time to do experiments. And then once we're ready to publish the data, we submit a manuscript to what's called the peer-reviewed scientific journal. Peer-reviewed because there are peers like me, other scientists that will read the, new, the, the article and check for errors. And it's a very thorough review here. I put two of them, usually they're at minimum of two, sometimes three, sometimes four. And they read the paper and tell you what's good, what's bad, what's ugly. And then they send you a review, you receive the review, you make changes to the paper. If you're lucky, it's just minor changes, but sometimes you have to redo more experiments, add experimental groups, add drug doses and so forth. And then when you're finally ready, you resubmit the paper. And if the paper is good, it gets published. If it's not, they re-review it and it goes round and round and round, but eventually, hopefully, you do get published. Publishing peer-reviewed journals is what scientists do, but there are other people that put data out there. And these people come from all sorts of places. They could be organizations or, and companies. It could also be people who claim they're scientists but are not, but have some credential from an unknown university or an, you know, uh, one that you have to just pay to get your credentials. But oftentimes we have good data from organizations and company and they tend to publish reports um, that are freely available often online. And if any of us is lucky, either the scientists or the companies, a reporter will pick it up and do their own publication in some sort of news uh, media for the lay public. And therefore, it's now ready for consumption for the lay. And at any point, the lay public organization, the scientist, the news person can spread the news around the world. And during all these steps, a lot of things can go wrong. So first of all, there could be just errors or ignorance on the part of any one of these to either interpret the information wrong or to actually produce wrong information. Hopefully not too much of this on the scientist's point of view, but it can happen. And then in addition to just ignorance and mistakes, there are also some maliciousness sometimes behind the way data are portrayed that is usually lucrative. And so we have to be careful about that. So I'm gonna go through a few things to try to prevent ignorance, mistakes, and maliciousness from, not from happening, but at least it will prevent us from not seeing it. And hopefully we'll be able to see these things. And on top of all of this, there's a lot of irrationality and the way we think that is not quite as rational as we would like it to be. So all of these come and can fool you in your ability to interpret data. So I'm going to describe all of these methods to, avo to avoid ignorance, mistakes, and maliciousness from interfering with your ability to judge data by going through what I call a really crash course experimental design 101 and interpretation of data. And I just chose a few things today. It was so hard to choose. And I don't even know if I'll manage to go over all of them. But I want to talk a little bit about correlation, control groups, graphs, percentages and proportions. And every time that I talk about science the way you're supposed to see it, I have this symbol here of science. And every time I talk about irrationality, I will have this symbol over here because both of them are important. So we have to understand our irrationality to see how we could see things wrong, but then we also have to learn how to do things properly with this uh, method over here. And um, before I go further, I just want to say that I started really loving irrationality when I took, took a course with Dan Ariely. It was a, one of these massive online courses, these MOOCs. It was a fantastic course. It really got me interested in it, and it sort of enriched uh, my teaching of experimental design and statistics that I was doing. So to do these um, demonstrations of all these different things that can go wrong, I'm going to present to you some data. The data will either be real, fictional, meaning just to make the point, just an example of invented data. We can't do that in science, but for a talk, it, 
I, I want to make some points. So I created some fictional data and then I'll have some anecdotes. So everything that's real will be in color. Fictional data will be in black and white as, and anecdotes are sometimes in color, sometimes not, but I will always tell you whether the data are real fictional or anecdotal. So let's begin. And I want to begin a little bit with irrationality. I show this all the time to my students. So they, if they're online looking, they're probably a little bit tired of this. But if I ask you, what do you see in this picture? The majority of you will say, I see a little girl with a red coat. Now, this is from Schindler's Lists, for those of you who don't know from this movie. But my point here is that there is one, a single person with a red coat, and there's a majority of the people in the background that are all gray and black and white. And when I ask someone, what do you see? They don't tell me the majority. They tell me the thing that stands out. And so it's a problem because really we are moved and excited by affirmatives more than by negatives. Things that stand out, things that are different are what catches our attention. And we exclude all the rest. We don't even pay attention. And so imagine in science, we produce data showing that things are equal, things don't differ. No one will pay any attention to them. But the moment that someone says, ha ha, something's different, everybody will jump onto this because they're excited by these affirmatives. And that can be a problem because it hides the knowledge of things that aren't different. In addition to that, every time something is different, every time we do get some positive results, like in gambling, for example, there are all these bells and whistles, all these uh, you know, sounds, lights, et cetera, to alert us that something special has happened. But let's say we play half an hour and 29 minutes we don't lose, we don't win, sorry. We don't remember those, we just remember the big moment when we won. And so again, everything that's affirmative, everything that's positive, everything that's different, we pay attention to and the rest not. And that's partly what leads to this dissemination of data of things that are different rather than things that are not the same and why there's so much hype about things that are different because that's what excites people. Um, I put a slot machine here just to remind me to say that when people play slot machines or other things, they tend to start thinking that maybe there's a pattern to, to what the game, the, how the game is going. They start counting, oh, this letter came out seven times, this other one came out 12 times, so then the chances are that this other one can be. So basically, people see a lot of patterns. And this um, was studied in what I'm gonna show you in the next slide, which is a study that was done by uh, Amos Tversky and Thomas Dilovich and uh, Robert Vallone, where they measured the number of, um, I never know how to say this, I'm not uh, American, so I don't know how you say when you put the, a basket into the, the hoop, I'll call it putting the basket, the, the ball into the hoop. And they measured how many times the, the basketball team put the ball into the hoop and they noticed that there are sometimes that the player hits it, sometimes they miss, hit, 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 miss, miss, hit, miss, hit, hit, hit. And if you ask both players, coaches, and people, is there a pattern to this? They'll tell you, yes, there is. Look, there's every time they hit, they, they get it, then they do it several times in a row. Basically, they have a lucky streak or what they call the hot hand at basketball. And they developed all sorts of theories behind it, saying that maybe they gain confidence and the more confidence they have, the more they can get the ball in there, all sorts of things. When in reality, this sequence over here is simply random. This is the original paper um, that was published. And they say that the random sequences are perceive, perceived as streak shooting if they are perceived like that, then no amount of exposure to such sequence will convince the player, the coach, or the fan that the sequences are in fact random. So people see random sequences, they think they're not random, they're convinced about it. So basically people see patterns when there's only randomness. And patterns can happen in so many other cases. 
Let me give you another example. And um, this is taken from another book by Kahneman and um, Tversky as well, about judgment under uncertainty, heuristics and biases, which basically tell us that the world is often uncertain. We don't know how things will be. And whenever they're uncertain, we try to make sense out of them by creating things that explain what's perhaps unexplainable. Perhaps in the old days, it was religion, right? If God was angry, it would send the rain. Now we're not quite like that, but we still make these associations. Here's an example. Let's imagine you're a mother that's homeschooling the, your kid because of COVID right now, and you want your kid to start working right at nine o'clock. And this kid does not. Whenever the kid is shown in red, the kid misbehaves, let's put it this way. So the mother reprimands the kid, no, 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 you should come on time. And the next day the kid comes on time. So the mother will assume that it is what she did that changed the kid from misbehaving to behaving well. And it goes on, the kid misbehaves again, the mother reprimands the kid and the kid behaves. And it keeps going on and on. And, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it does not, but most of the time, this parent, this teacher, whoever it is, will assume that there's a causality in their action when there's really none. This is actually the original sequence from the um, Jilovich and Tversky and Vallone paper, where there's only randomness, but the mother assumes that she is creating um, a change. She is the causal link between what the kid is doing when in reality there is no link. There are many other examples. Let's imagine that someone is sick. They go to the doctor, they take pills and they get better. They will associate getting better with having taken the pills when there's actually no evidence that that's exactly what happened. Other example, someone is fine and then they're sick one day, they throw up and they remember that they ate eggs the other day or right before, they will assume that they got sick because of the eggs when in reality there's very little evidence that, that there is a link between them. So we make these associations, we make this causality when in reality there is none. And what does this do? Especially as scientists, we're so used to causal action um, that we, we create an action and there's a real consequence that when we don't have it, we say, well, what's, what's wrong? We, we start developing superstitious behavior, but we're not the only ones. Everybody starts developing superstitious behavior, thinking that their actions are truly causing something. And actually pigeons do it too. Here's a movie of a pigeon developing superstitious behavior. Sixty years ago, the American psychologist B.F. Skinner investigated the behavior of pigeons, rewarding them with food when they learned to peck a key in the feeding apparatus. But then Skinner set the apparatus to reward the birds at random. Now the pigeons just had to sit back and wait. But that isn't what they did. Instead, the majority developed what Skinner called superstitious behavior. When an individual pigeon, for example, happened to look over its left shoulder and the reward mechanism just happened to click in at that point, it would have got the idea that it was looking over the left shoulder that had got it the reward, so it tried it again. By sheer luck, as it happened, the reward mechanism delivered food at the same time again. And so the pigeon was reinforced in its idea that looking over the left shoulder was what got it the reward. And it went on and on and turned into a maniac for looking over the left shoulder. Humans can. So that's an example. Pigeons too develop superstitious behavior. Be no better. The next thing I want to talk about a little bit are correlations. Let's imagine you have here a positive correlation between the amount of olive oil people take and the amount of wrinkles. So you see these are each subject and the more olive oil you take, the less wrinkles you have, the less olive oil you take, the more wrinkles you have. We call this the response variable, the y-axis, and the x-axis, the explanatory or predictive variable to try to determine does this olive oil predict the amount of wrinkles. But 
there could be many reasons why there is this association. And let's have another person who I really admire explain it to us a little bit better. And that's Ben Goldacre. Ben Goldacre wrote this book called Bad Science. There are various uh, editions of it according to where you live in the world. And I recommend uh, you read it, it's really well done. So Ben Goldacre explains uh, this relationship between olive oil and wrinkles. So I'm a doctor, but I kind of slipped sideways into research, and now I'm an epidemiologist. And nobody really knows what epidemiology is. Epidemiology is the science of how we know in the real world if something is good for you or bad for you. Here's another example. This is from uh, Britain's leading diet nutritionist in the Daily Mirror, which is our second biggest selling newspaper. An Australian study in 2001 found that olive oil in combination with fruits, vegetables and pulses offers measurable protection against skin wrinkling. So then they give the advice, if you eat olive oil and vegetables, you'll have fewer skin wrinkles. And they very helpfully tell you how to find the paper. So you go and find the paper. And what you find is an observational study, right? Obviously, nobody has ever been able to go back to like 1930, get all of the people born in one maternity unit and half of them eat lots of fruit and veg and olive oil, and then half of them eat McDonald's, and then we see how many wrinkles you've got later. You have to take a snapshot of how people are now. And what you find is, of course, people who eat fruit and veg and olive oil have fewer skin wrinkles. But that's because people who eat fruit and veg and olive oil, they're freaks, okay? They're not normal. They're like you. They come to <laughs> events like this, right? They are posh, they're wealthy, they're less likely to have outdoor jobs, they're less likely to do manual labor, they have better social support, they're less likely to smoke. So for a whole host of fascinating interlocking social, political, and cultural reasons, they are less likely to have skin wrinkles. That doesn't mean that it's the vegetables or the olive oil. So it could be many things that, um, why this association exists. And let me give you a few other examples, okay? Not with olive oil anymore, but let's do this one over here amount of smoking and severity of lung cancer, there's a positive correlation over here. These are fictional data, they're not real, but there is a co correlation that does exist in um, reality. And so this likely is a causal effect, maybe causing uh, smoking does actually cause lung cancer. But correlations aren't always causal, they could actually be other things as well. In this case, we have the amount of cancer medication here, correlates with the severity of lung cancer. In this case, it's not the medication that's causing the lung cancer, but the medication is a consequence of the lung cancer. So there's still a relationship, but it's not causal, it's a consequence. And then there could be other things. So the amount of coffee correlates with lung cancer. The correlation truly does exist. It's not this one that I'm showing you here, but there does exist a correlation. Why is that? Does coffee cause lung cancer? Or do people with lung cancer drink more coffee? No, it turns out that people who drink coffee also smoke. So there's an indirect link that associates coffee with lung cancer and the mediator is actually cigarettes. So correlations, when there you see a correlation, the explanatory variable can be the cause of the response variable. It could be the consequence. It could be that there's a confounding factor, just like coffee, or it could also be totally unrelated and not existing at all, just a pure coincidence. And cause and consequence can be actually cyclical, okay? One can maybe cause it, and then it becomes a consequence and so forth. So just keep that in mind whenever you hear news articles about correlations, that there is no causation necessarily, there's just a correlation. And when there is, it could be a cause, but it could also be a consequence or there could be a confounding factor, just like Ben Goldacre explained about the olive oil. So if we really had to determine whether coffee increases lung cancer, what would we do? We would need to set up an experiment with control groups. So let's look a little bit at control groups. So for control groups, I showed you before, that someone who's perhaps ill takes a medicine and then gets better and they will attribute the getting better to the medicine when that's not the case. I'll give you another example. Kids in school then take a fish oil pill and then they increase their learning. Can we say that the fish oil increased their learning? No, we cannot because so many things can happen. First of all, there's a passage of time. So we don't know if learning increased just simply because time passed or because they had more practice in learning. So we don't know that at all. And there's so many variables that can 
come into play, the time of the year, you know, the amount of exercise that they had, so many things. So we can't say that this fish oil is what increased learning. In order to do that, we need to run a test with a placebo that looks exactly like the fish oil pill, but does not contain the fish oil pill. So everything is identical except for the variable of interest. And if you're lucky and there is no improvement in learning, you can say that it was this right here that improved learning. But you might be unlucky and it was not at all the medicine, the, the fish oil pill that improved learning. Um, it was just something else. And in that case, you would only spot it if you run a proper control with a placebo. <clears throat> Next, I want to talk about graphs because graphs are a very easy thing that is used to trick people, whether maliciously or not. These are just data from uh, the University of Berkeley that shows the number of students, the percentage of students in different programs. I don't remember what they were, math, science, whatever. Okay, so this is the percentages. And you can see with a bar graph, a very um, clear, in, you know, um, bigger amount of student, larger amount of students in the red program than in the blue program. But oftentimes people don't depict things with bar graphs, but they depict them with pie charts like these. And I just want to alert to you that it's harder to look to to grasp the magnitude the differences um, with a pie chart here c looks quite different from e but not necessarily from d when in reality they are it's just very hard to see and it becomes even harder when they give you these 3d graphs where the area that a slice occupies does not truly represent the magnitude of um, that effect of oh, that uh, portion of the slides. And here's the same exact graph, but shifted. I just rotated it. And you can see how different you can interpret them. Here, the E group looks very large, and here it looks very small, simply because the angle is different. So just be aware of pie charts, especially the 3D ones. Don't look at them and think that you grasp what the effect is, because they're very difficult to interpret. Another thing that happens commonly is what we call zooming in on the graph. Here is the student satisfaction in college courses in Latin, math, and science. And again, these are just fictitious data. And you can say that the science teacher is super happy because they have much better success rate than the other ones. But in reality, this is really zoomed in. Look at this, this starts at 94%. So the difference is very little after all. And if you look at the entire scale, you can see that really, it's a non-significant difference. It's a non-biologically relevant difference. On the other hand, uh, oh, I put here some cars just to remind me that it's done frequently, like how many cars are sold, which group sells more and so forth. And it may look a big difference when in reality it isn't. The opposite is called zooming out. This is the temperature on earth across uh, from 1880 and 2020, and it looks pretty stable. What's all this thing about global warming? Look, it looks quite the same. It looks a little bit increased if we put a line in between the average of the 19th century, but still not very much. That's zooming out. This zooming out is not biologically relevant. What's biologically relevant is to look at the deviations from the average. And when you look at those, this is how it looks. And it's relevant because a change in 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit is huge and can really make a big difference to our planet. Something that you didn't quite grasp if you saw it zooming out, but you do when you look at the biologically relevant unit. A few other things, this is a graph. I put numbers of why it could be anything. It could be cookies sold, uh, people entering the hospital, whatever you want. And this is just fictional data across the years. And it looks like there's a big increase in this number of people in the whatever you're measuring. But look at the tick marks. Even though the years, they, they're all distributed evenly, the years are not evenly distributed. The, there's a misleading distance between the tick marks. And when we fix that distance, the graph looks quite different. This is just total numbers not corrected by population size. Neither is this one over here. So let's correct this one by population size. And you see that it looks quite different. 
the ticks are still wrong. Let's correct the ticks too. And here it looks different again. So four different ways of depicting the exact same data. Only one of them is correct, but you might be encountering different ones. So these are misleading axes and they're not normalized. Another example of normalizing, this shows data from the Department of Education of the number of restraints in schools when kids are, um, for various reasons, are often restrained, well, not often, are restrained in schools. And this is a number of students that get restrained according to race. And you can see that the white students get restrained, many more of them than other students. This is percentage out of total students, the same thing because it's percentage. But the population isn't quite the same. And if we divide each um, the number of students in each race by how many students in that race there are, the situation will look quite different. You have something that looks like this. Percentage of restraint of their own race, if you are Black, you are 10 times more likely to be restrained than if you are Asian, and about twice more likely to be restrained than if you are white. Something that you did not see over here when you didn't correct by um, the proportion of that population. So again, just to alert you that the way you depict data can give you very different messages. Inflation percent increases. This is another tricky one. This is a true study, memory in children with or without treatment. And the treatment is amphetamine. Amphetamine is a treatment for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. And you can see that neurotypical boys and boys with ADHD both equally improve their memory after amphetamine. And if you were asked to describe this, you'd say there are two parallel lines. They increase the same amount. But now if I graph it as percentage of their baseline of their placebo, the situation looks quite different. You would say that the kids with ADHD increase much more. So again, how you depict the data really changes the message that you send. Just be aware of it at least. And choose what's the most biologically relevant one. There isn't necessarily a right or wrong. Sometimes percentages are what you need to present, sometimes not. Here's another example. <clears throat> Let me skip this one here. Here's another example. This is again data from University of California, Berkeley. The number of males and females that were accepted in different programs, program A to F versus those who had applied. And when this came out, someone sued the University of Berkeley because they said, you discriminate. Look, you're um, accepted accepting 45% of males, but only 30% of females. That's discrimination. So if you plot this, you can see 30% of females versus 45% of males. Actually, that's just the number. And if you do it in percentage, you can see it there better. And the way they calculated this percentage is by dividing the number, the total number of accepted students by the total number of applied students in both cases. But that's wrong. If you look more carefully, and let's look at each program individually, for the program A, the number of accepted students was 62% for males, and it was higher for females. Program B, a little bit lower in males and higher in females. Most programs have a higher percentage of females accepted than males. So how is this? Right. So if you do the aggregate, if you base your average, uh, your, your percentage on the average, you get a very different result than if you get it, uh, if you do it on every different program. So here it's every different program. The females almost always win against the males. And as you see in the end, the proportion of students that get accepted in both program is very similar, slightly higher for the females than the males, but definitely not different. Definitely not worthy of a lawsuit. If anything, the males are preferred. This is called Simpson's paradox. When groups go in different directions, but when you do the aggregate, they look, the situation looks quite different. 
So let's go back to correlation. There's a similar thing to Simpson's paradox there too. This is just a, a fictional graph that I showed you before. And I want to alert to you that in correlations, what you want to do is two measurements in the same subject. And when you don't do that, there's trouble. Here's real data about happiness and how it relates to uh, GDP, to wealth across different countries. And the size of the balls here is just the, the size of the, the, how many people are in each country. And you see what looks like a positive correlation between wealth and happiness. But that's wrong to conclude that because you're not measuring it in the same individuals. If you go measure it in the same individuals, it's possible that you see a negative correlation within each country. So when you do, when you make an inference about individuals based on aggregates, we call that ecological fallacy. And it's very similar to Simpson's paradox that I showed you before. When you choose aggregates, you have a positive correlation, but in reality, within each one, there is a negative correlation. So whenever you see a graph that has aggregates and makes a conclusion, you can't do it at all. You can't make a conclusion based on correlation purely, you need causality, but you furthermore can't do it when you're not measuring the same thing in the same subjects. Let's try to see, um, oops, how to bring it all together. This is a true study. And in reality, the study was very careful in not making wrong conclusions, but I wanna show it here um, because people could misinterpret it quite easily. These are depression scores before and after a certain treatment in a population using two different scales. So it's great, they replicate the experiment and they use two different scales to increase their validity. And they see that depression decreases after treatment. So does anybody spot what's wrong? Right, that it's missing a control group. We don't know if this improvement is truly due to the fact that they receive treatment or simply just going to the doctor's office every day or the passage of time or who knows what else it could be. So without a control group, you can't make any conclusions. In addition to that, these scales have been zoomed out. When you show the entirety of the scales, the situation looks quite different. So if we plotted the level of depression as none, mild, moderate, moderately severe, severe, yes, there is an improvement, but is it really that biologically relevant? And here too, it's not such a big deal. So again, biological relevance, missing control groups, and Honestly, these authors did not make these mistakes in their conclusions, but I'm just showing it to you how easy it could be for someone to pick this up and say treatment is fantastic, increases um, happiness, and there's no control group, and the scale doesn't really make sense. Furthermore, they measured suicidal ideation before treatment and after treatment, and they had two patients here who had suicidal ideation, and here they had one. And people could pick this up and say, hey, suicidal ideation halved from two to one. So again, be careful when dealing with percentages because they can be quite misleading. So until now, I've shown you a lot of mistakes that can happen in correlations, controls, graphs, percentages, and proportions. One of them was visualizing graphs. Be careful of 3D graphs that don't uh, represent the magnitude correctly. Be careful about scales, zooming in, zooming out, tick marks not distributed correctly. Be careful when you normalize, if it's not corrected by the population. There might be an inflation, I call this inflation, but it, it enhancement of an effect if your baseline point is very low. Okay, so something that are two parallel lines, the lower line when you present it as percentage will look much bigger. And be careful also whether things are biologically relevant or not. There could be effects, but they might not be biologically relevant. Correlations, make sure that you are not making assumptions on individuals based on aggregates. I wanna go back though to the irrationality portion. So until now, as scientists, I suppose we are quite safe about all this stuff. We know it, we, 
usually don't make these mistakes. Of course, other people can, and then, you know, cascade wrong information about it. But you, we usually are not, but we still have a rationality, all of us do. So I wanna bring back to the Schindler's List picture. Positive results, things that stand out are things that we will really remember more. And that's a problem for us scientists as well. So we have to be really careful not to focus on these positive things and just remember the positive things. Another thing that happens often is that, let's say you have an idea, you, you, you have a preconceived you know, preference. Let's say you like dogs and someone else likes cats. And then uh, you're both given uh, information, new information, and one goes with what you believe, dogs are more intelligent than cats, and the other one goes against what you believe, cats are more intelligent than dogs, and goes with this guy's belief. So this guy will think that this paper is great, and this guy, on the other hand, will think that this other paper is great, and both of them will find reasons why the other paper is wrong. And this is true also as scientists, and we have to be very careful that we discard information that does not match our beliefs. And as a, as a reader, you will find it a lot of times again. So something to be very careful about. And that would lead to cherry picking. Another example that happens if you know what you're dealing with, let's say you're reading a letter of, of application for a job by a librarian, or by a, a, of a car salesman, and both of them are identical, they have some introverted traits and some extroverted traits. When you have to remember what are the characteristics of these individuals, those who know you're getting the CV or the letter of, of um, application of a librarian will mostly re recall traits that fit the librarian stereotype, whereas the other one will look and think they fit the car salesman stereotype. So even though they're reading the exact same things, they will remember something very different. And that's a problem because we label things this way. And then we just see the label. So let's say a child has ADHD and you know it, you're going to look at that child and think that the child is always getting in trouble. Uh, and if someone has, um, you think is you're, you're doing a treatment, you will think that the treatment is having an effect just because you're seeing only the things that match your beliefs. So we overvalue confirmatory information for any hypothesis, we have this confirmation bias. So a bottom line about all of these illusions um, can be summarized by this other great talk uh, by Michael Shermer. Hey, I am Michael Shermer, the director of the Skeptic Society, the publisher of Skeptic Magazine. We investigate claims of the paranormal, pseudoscience, and fringe groups, and cults, and claims of all kinds between. In this case, um, supposedly, uh, these messages are hidden in electronic phenomena. There's a reversespeech.com webpage in which I downloaded this stuff. Here is the forward. This is the most famous one of all of these. Here's the forward version of the very famous song. backwards and see if you can hear the hidden messages that are supposedly in there. Okay, well, at least we got Satan. Now I will prime your auditory part of your brain to tell you what you're supposed to hear and then hear it again. <laughs>
can't miss it when I tell you what's there. So bottom line, we see what we're looking for. And that's a problem with all of us. But there are other problems that are almost the opposite. Let's look at this one. Some of you might know it already. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? So this is the opposite. So when you're not looking for something, you don't see it. So it's really hard to navigate this world full of um, you know, these difficulties. Now, the original uh, study was from um, Christopher Chabris and Daniel Simons, and they wrote this book called The Invisible Gorilla, another book that I recommend you read. Uh, basically here, the message I wanted to say, even though we, we, look what, we see what we're looking for, but we don't see what we're not looking for. And finally, another thing by one of my favorite, my idols, Daniel Kahneman, that our memory is influenced by many things. Now, I'd like to start with an example of somebody who had a question and answer session after one of my lectures reported a story, and that was the story. He said he had been listening to a symphony, and it was absolutely glorious music, and at the very end of the recording, there was a dreadful screeching sound. And then he added, really quite emotionally, it ruined the whole experience. But it hadn't. What it had ruined were the memory of the experience. He had had the experience. He had had 20 minutes of glorious music. They counted for nothing because he was left with a memory, the memory was ruined, and the memory was all that he had gotten to. So that's another problem, right? So we, we see all these graphs, we get everything right, and then we just don't remember things well. We are influenced by our emotions, by our mindset, and it's hard to keep things straight unless we catalog, catalog everything properly. And as scientists, we tend to do it, but it's hard there too. And in the lay audience, I guess it's even harder because you don't systematically catalog everything, the feelings at every time and point. And you sort of might remember things that happen at the beginning or at the end, more or less. There are a few other biases that occur a lot. One of them is a primacy and recency effect, like we saw Kahneman, what you, he remembered what happened at the end, plus it was a, a dramatic event. So it was like the girl in their little red coat, right? So that's what the person focuses on. But there are other things too, like the anchoring effect or the halo effect. And when I ask people what their guesstimate is for this multiplication, Students will tell me different answers according to whether they get the, the same exact multiplication, but starting from one and ending in eight or starting at eight and ending in one. Okay. And so this is what they get. They get quite different values because what they do is that they anchor it on the first number that they see on the, um, and so they think this will be larger than this one over here. And the anchoring effect is what dictates a lot of advertisements. For example, you might be told that this product costs $290. And then over here, if you anchor it with a 400, you will feel that you're getting a big deal for it. So when you navigate things out there, every time they show you a big number, you have this big number in your mind, you see a small one, you're thinking, oh, wow, it's a fantastic deal. And you wouldn't think that you're getting a fantastic deal with this, even though you're getting exactly the same deal, just because someone sneaked in this higher number in there. This brings
brings me um, to another thing that has to do with the anchoring effect that's used doing questionnaires. If I ask someone, how many times did you, I don't know, look at your cell phone today, drink coffee, drink alcohol, what have you, and I give you two different scales, a short scale in one group and a long scale in the other, people who have the shorter scale will give shorter answers, I mean, smaller numbers than people who have the larger scale. So again, they anchor their response with a number and they will give, they will put a judgment that matches closer to this number. And if it's low, it will be a low response. And if it's high, it will be a high response. Which brings us to the next thing. This is one of my favorites about um, surveys. So this is a survey that really shows us that what drives our results is not really what we think it is. These are the rates of organ donors across countries. And you can see that there are some countries that have very low effect, uh, percentage of people who are willing to donate their organs. And there are countries that have very high percentages of people who want to donate their organs. And there are countries that are quite similar, Germany and Austria, look at the difference. And I don't know, Netherlands and Belgium, Denmark and Sweden, yet they're so different in the rate. And Netherlands had it very low, but they did a massive campaign to try to increase it and they managed, but only to 27.5%, which is about a third of what the other countries are. So why is this? Is it that these people don't care about donating their organs and these people think it's a good thing? No, not at all. It turns out it really depends how you ask people. So the people, in this category over here, we're asked to check this box if they want to participate in the organ donation program. What's called an explicit consent. Do you explicitly want to participate in it? What's called opt-in. And this is done when you go get your driver's license or to renew it. On the other hand, these people here were asked, check this box if you do not want to participate in the organ donation. So they're giving implicit consent by not clicking the box. This is called opt out. Look what a big difference, simply by the way you ask the question. So why is it? Do they not care to look at the box? No, on, on the contrary, they do, but it's a very difficult situation. A decision to make, you have to imagine yourself dead. Do you want to donate your organs? It's not an easy thing. So you just don't think about it, right? You just avoid it. And by avoiding it in this case, you're not donating your organs. And by avoiding it in this case, you're automatically donating it. So when you do see surveys that have opt-in, opt-out questions, be sure to know that the results will be very biased and they will lead in one direction if it's opt-in and in the other direction if it's opt-out. And finally, the problem is that we all have a biased blind spot. This is, um, I got this from uh, AUT uh, website, the, um, and it says that one study found that 64% of doctors believe that the freebies they receive from pharmaceutical companies influence their doctors. So 64% of doctors should be influenced, but then only 16% of doctors thought that it affected them. And that's so typical. We call this a biased blind spot. Other people call it other ways, but when I study all this stuff and teach it, even I say, oh, yeah, but it happens to you guys. It doesn't happen to me. It's such a natural thing to think, right? It happens to others. But I hope that I convince you that these uh, fallacies are really, really very uh, common. So just, uh, you know, there is a lot of irrationality and fallacies that occur. And hopefully by knowing a few rules about experimental design, we can avoid have being ignorant or making mistakes or not spotting maliciousness when there is. And I hope that now you can navigate data a little bit better, or at least know that it's very hard to navigate and that you have to be really careful about so many things, about having uh, appropriate correlations, appropriate control groups, graphs that don't trick you. And when you deal with proportions, be very careful about them as well. So I'm done with my talk and I'd like to introduce um, the, the, the next speakers. Oh, one last thing. Okay, I gave you a lot of uh, anecdotes here, but anecdotes are not data. As Ben Goldacre says, the pool of anecdote is not data. So be careful, though anecdotes are what sticks in our mind when you read a single story, 
it doesn't mean that the reality is that, okay? We need a control study with control groups and enough, a large enough population to be able to make any conclusion. So I was saying, these are my panels. So I have Sofia Piperno. Sofia is an undergraduate student. She's working with me on a project um, about errors in, in published data. And she's also taking my class analytical skepticism. And she's, she did really well last year. And this year, she's a fantastic TA. Sean took the class analytical skepticism the prior year and then contacted me later on because he was uh, became a data analyst and um, some of the stuff that we used in class he, he was um, found quite useful in data analysis. So now we have you know the student, the student who moved on and finally going up to the very top, the, the, the professor. Kristen Harvey, she's a director of undergraduate studies and associate professor of instruction in the Department of Statistics and Data Scientists. I had the pleasure in these teaching days that we're able to watch how other faculty teach. I watched her teach and I was quite inspired and I thought that what she taught was quite relevant to uh, the seminar and so I asked her to join here. And so we have from the you know, undergraduate to out of college to then having uh, a faculty position. So I have the whole gamut and uh, we are quite ready for your questions. Thank you. Okay, we have quite a few questions already. Okay, let's see. This is a hard one. So I don't know if anyone in the group is willing to take this. What makes some people more success susceptible to conspiracy theories than others? It's a hard one. Does anyone want to give it a try? Go ahead, Kristen. I mean, to me, that's that the, that answer has to do more with psychology of uh, <laughs> of uh, you know what what makes people more susceptible to um, you know just believing kind of outlandish things and looking looking for you know like you said kind of those patterns that aren't there. Um, I know there's a lot of research. This is unfortunately not my area of expertise, but I know that there's you know a lot of research that um, you know kind of there. There's this kind of almost, um, I, I hate to use the word laziness, but just of, of not kind of critical thinking that, that happens that allows us to kind of say, well, conspiracy theory is a simpler thing to believe than trying to understand the complexity of our world. And I think that that sometimes feeds into what can make some people more susceptible to these conspiracy theories because um, as complex as they are, they're actually usually simpler explanations than the reality of the situation. Um, I don't know if that really yes, answers that's the question. Yes, that's absolutely true. Yeah, and they're very susceptible. And unfortunately, false information goes uh, travels further than, than correct information. So uh, that's uh, difficult. So um, we have a question here. How do we discern between causal patterns and random patterns? like the ones in basketball, anyone? Well, yeah, we basically, yeah, go ahead, Sean. Yeah, so, um, you know, my first thought is that depends on the sort of experiment that you're gonna be running. So there are a couple of different types of experiments that you can do. You can do a correlational experiment, which would help identify these sort of correlations and trends that you find interesting, or you can do a causal experiment in which point you are intentionally manipulating the variable that you're interested in seeing and seeing if it has an outcome. So it's really important to remember that if you see a correlation, it does not mean there's any sort of causation until there is a causal study that is done sort of confirming what you may have already inferred by the correlation. Something else that I think is important that Mickey talked about in her presentation is making sure that you have a control group to refer back to um, just having a control group can just change your perception on things as well. Okay, we have a few more uh, questions here. 
Um, how can we change the scientific method that is the peer review process to minimize biases and errors? You know, it's hard, right? Nowadays, the papers we have to publish don't have two or three techniques that they used to, they have 10. So technically 10 people are supposed to review them, but we don't always have 10 people who are willing to, or is it feasible to send it to 10 people? So it's a difficult thing. So I think the best way is to have proper training so that you don't fall into these traps. And then what you produce is solid. Can I, can I also add, I think one of the important things is there's been a real focus on transparency um, in, in publications now and that people publish, you know, not only their publishable results, but also the process, um, the detailed process by which they got that and even publishing their data sets so that people can actually check their statistics um, as they're doing these studies. That was not, you know, a common thing that was done years ago, but it's really, there's been a movement that, you know, the only way to really know is to, to just go in and actually check people's results um, to be able to follow the process through step by step. And I think that's a, a really good step forward for improving the scientific method itself. Yeah, and I, I'm not really sure that there's a ton of room for improving the method itself, but it's important to realize that there are all sorts of checks within any experiment that help account for these sort of biases. So an experiment, for example, will have control groups or they'll have placebos or they'll have blinds. So people collecting the data aren't influencing the outcomes. People analyzing the data aren't influencing the outcomes and people actually being studied aren't influencing the outcomes either. So it's a balance of a lot of different things that help sort of build trust in the study and add to visibility. Yeah, and other things that are important, I feel, for studies are to do, first of all, make sure that you're doing it properly, have, you have good internal validity, but also then to replicate it, to make sure it is really real. Because sometimes the first time you run it, you know, you get an effect and wow, you think that's it, but actually you keep doing it and you regress to the true mean, right? And, but because the, our minds are just to remember the positive results, we will remember only the positive. And an example of that is the uh, difference in size in the corpus callosum between females and males. It's the same, but the first studies showed that there was a difference and that's what everybody remembers, okay? Something that is different shows up, people fixate on that. So replicate many times, even before you publish, so you're more sure, and also replicate in different conditions. Don't just study, college kids, study college kids and people who live here, here and there to have external validity. We have someone who asks, Costco puts high priced TVs at the entry. Does everything else there seem less expensive? I hadn't thought of it, but definitely that's a beautiful anchoring effect, yes. And the little cheapy things at the cashier too. Um, so someone asked some of the phenomena you talked about are used in popular culture, like zooming in, uh, how changes in stock market, how often do you think these actions are done intentionally to fool us? I don't know, but a lot <laughs> are done. That's why I put the little malicious man in my slides, because I think sometimes that is the case. When there is money to be made, um, that often is the priority. So now that you know, look at them carefully so at least you won't be fooled. I, I was gonna add, I use an example in my classes of um, there was some, there was a chart that was made by the, the Texas Department of Public Safety when they were presenting to um, the Texas legislature a few years ago. And it essentially, when you look at the chart, you, you start to notice that the, the bottom group, which is a very short bar is tens of thousands of people where the upper bars where it was the effect that they were trying to make a point about was only a few thousand people. And turns out their scale started at 86% and went to 100%. And a number of people wrote in and statisticians got onto them for this. And they eventually had to retract the chart. But I mean, that was presented at the Texas legislature to make a point. And it was a very intentionally misleading graph. So it's, it's done in many realms. Um, in the example about doctors and farm influence, are the two results really in conflict? 
if you if a minority of doctors are influenced, then isn't true that their colleagues are influenced? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I think probability wise, if you query 64, uh, 100 of them and 64 think there is bias, then technically you should find, you know, 64% 60, of them have it, then technically 64 should admit to it. Okay, let's see. Question for Sean. How has skepticism been helpful in industry? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so the example that comes to mind is actually an example that I originally emailed Dr. Marinelli about. Um, I was tasked with analyzing a big data set specifically related to people who had uh, tested positive for COVID. So what I was looking for were just interesting trends. And I know that there had been a lot of studies that had been conducted finding, you know, increased mortality rates if you have some sort of comorbidity. So I wanted to dive into that a little bit more. And um, I took two groups. I took um, people who had tested positive for COVID that were not classified as obese. And then I took a group of people who tested positive for COVID that were classified as obese. And I looked at the average mortality rate for both groups. And I found that the people who were not obese actually had a higher mortality rate, which didn't seem right to me. So I split the data up into age buckets. And I found that across every single age bucket, people who had or who were obese had higher mortality rates than people who were not obese. So that's a good example of Simpson's paradox that I was able to pick up on, because in this case, the data was really driven by um, the mortality rate of the elderly. And there were less elderly obese people to help drive that data and bump up that mortality rate. So when you look at the two you know, blended aggregates, it was really misleading because it didn't make any sense that people who didn't have obesity were dying at a higher rate than people that did. So that's one example that really helped, um, or at least where Dr. Marinelli's class really helped influence my investigation. Thank you, Sean. We have a few uh, other people who asked to discuss a little bit more about Simpson's paradox. Would you feel like doing it, Sean or Sophia or anyone? Well, I was just gonna add, um, I think one of the points um, and what Sean's example brings up is this idea of lurking variables. These variables that are part of the data that are causing effects um, between our two variables that were initially ignored. They weren't part of the study. You know, you said age wasn't initially part of what you were looking at, but you realized that it had this effect. And often that's what causes these Simpson's paradox um, problems is that um, I think somebody had mentioned in one of the questions, you know, this kind of, well, why do you just always aggregate? Well, it's because we don't realize that there is this grouping effect that is kind of hidden and that is caused by that lurking variable, that variable that's under kind of the data kind of hiding back there. Yeah, another example is kind of related. I, I remember a, a colleague um, was doing a study and they, they were measuring how long people stayed in the hospital and how much it cost to stay, stay in the hospital. And they, these were people who had been admitted because of, of a heart attack. And they realized that one group um, was leaving much earlier and they were taking antidepressants. So they said, oh my goodness, look at this, maybe antidepressants help heal the heart, right? And so they found out it's true. All those people who were taking antidepressants were in, in fact leaving the hospital earlier. Well, it turns out that they hadn't realized that the people who were taking antidepressants was an enriched population of females. And in that settings, females were leaving the hospital earlier. They were mothers that had kids, et cetera. So they weren't staying as long. So in fact, it wasn't the, the medication, but it was perhaps uh, being female. So that would be a lurking variable. And if you aggregate everyone because you have a higher proportion of females in one group, it will drive your average in one direction versus the other group that has less of them. Uh, 
Someone asked, do you think that in the area of big data, there are more correlations being found than really being incorrect? Sophia, do you want to talk about the, the um, zodiac sign experiment and the percentage of false positives? Um, I have to say, don't quite remember that experiment from class. It's been a while and it hasn't been covered yet. But I definitely think now with people just trying to find correlations, they try to find correlations with anything. I remember in one of my biostatistics class, my professor was showing that the number of Nicolas Cage movies and how many movies he was in was correlated with the amount of ice creams eaten. And of course that has nothing to do with it, but just because how the data was, they correlated it. So, you know, in some circumstances there might be an actual correlation, but in some that are just so silly, like the example I just said, there probably isn't a correlation. And I think it's important just kind of stepping back and just looking at the data and thinking about it logically, if it makes sense, and then that can really help in some circumstances. And in others, you probably would have to do more like experimental trials or something like that to see if there's actually a correlation. And in these big data uh, trials, and maybe Sean will speak more to it because he's doing a lot of that, we do uh, correct for multiple comparisons. So we usually um, uh, allot ourselves a 5% chance of false positives, but the more multiple comparisons we do, the more this percent of false positives uh, changes. So um, the, the margin of error uh, is different. So the more comparisons we do, the more we know we would get false positives, so we change how many we can accept. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to expand a little bit on what Sophia was, was talking about. Um, so correlation does not imply causation, and it's really important as consumers of these data that we keep that in mind. So anytime you're presented with an interesting correlation, you have to think, okay, but what did they do to determine whether or not this was actually caused by something? And a lot of times it's really superficial, really shallow analysis. So you have to do your own sort of investigation into whether or not what was published was actually really looked over. Um, and I, I think that, you know, that's really important, especially when we've got access to so many different forms of information and news and stuff that we keep in mind, correlation does not imply causation and interesting trends are just playing upon our own internal biases and the biases that make us more prone to accepting that sort of data. Totally unrelated, but someone just sent me, you say dunk. Okay, so the basketball in the basket dunk. Okay, <laughs> I'll never learn it. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, um... How can we learn not to be fooled, manipulated in these ways? It's hard because, you know, so it, it's easy when you know the tricks of the trade. So you're going to now look at the scales, you're going to look at that. But then there are these irrationalities and those that are very difficult. At least becoming aware of them is a first step. But because we have a, bias, uh, a blind side to our biases, it's, it's really hard. Um, at the same time, though, the more you practice it, the more you see it. I know that some students in my class said, you ruined me. Now everything I see, I see flaws. <laughs> so it's, it becomes easier to, to spot errors, um, but it's hard. Uh, I, um, yeah, I was just gonna add in there as well that, um, you know, one of the things you can do to kind of check, you talked about, um, Nikki, you talked about, you know, people putting these studies on Twitter and they're, they're out there, you know, and you see this little snippet of a headline um, and you use that as your now new basis of information. So I always teach my students, go backwards from that snippet, go to the article that talks about it, find the source for the original article and even if you only read, you know, the abstract of the actual article, you will probably learn that whatever you read on Twitter was, you know, 90% wrong um, because it things it's, it's like a game of telephone getting out um, into, into the world. So, you know, always going backwards from that snippet to the original source, I think is a really good way to try and protect yourself from being fooled. Um, and to check the validity of that source. Was it actually a peer reviewed journal? There's a lot of journals out there now that people just pay a sum of money and now it's in this thing that looks like a very legitimate journal. And so, um, you know, checking to see is, 
is this actually a peer reviewed document or not? Yeah, it's absolutely true. Um, you have to do that, otherwise you don't know. Um, so you have to be a critical mind, but then when you see it, you go backwards and you should see all these uh, what do you bait, click bait things that they put that you want to click on it, what's going on, and then it has absolutely no reality behind it, right? But it got to you and that's what you'll remember because we are moved by the affirmative, by the little girl with the red dress, the red coat, you know? Yeah. So someone's asking how big of an issue is p-hacking in research? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to take that. Yeah, um, so, I mean, p-hacking is, it's a huge problem. It's um, essentially, uh, I guess like a basic definition is, is that for just trying to get a p-value that looks significant, which in a lot of examples is a p-value less than 0.05. And it's essentially people will do whatever it takes to get that because they think they need that in order to publish a result. Um, so it can take a lot of different forms, like people can run their tests in a certain way, they don't get the results they want, and then they'll start excluding people who didn't meet the pattern and say, okay, well now if I just exclude these people, my results are significant. Um, or if I just run essentially you know, a huge number of tests on this data, I'll eventually find something significant, which is true, you will eventually find something significant by chance. Um, uh, and it kind of goes back to what Sophia was talking about with the spurious correlations. So it's become a huge problem just kind of when the number is more the pursuit than the actual truth in the science, we have a real problem um, with kind of any field that uh, that becomes the goal. I, I don't know how sort of appropriate this is and pseudo philosophical, but I think part of the problem is also the audience, right? The audience gets excited by these affirmatives. That's what they buy, right? That's what they click all the time. And if only stopped clicking, right? And we only, um, we, we weren't um, so trying to titillate our brain with these shiny things, maybe we would get closer to the truth rather than to these things. If you notice, and this is anecdotal, so it might not be real, but people are more interested in what could happen. You know, there's a risk for this, you know, all these things. And uh, it's quite amazing. There's a study um, that looked at uh, the spread of false information on Twitter. And what is the biggest predictor? I mean, what, what correlates the most with the spread is like disgust and novelty, okay? Surprise. So those are the two things that really uh, push people in, in, in one direction. And so it's also the users that are, are driving it. There's a question here. I've read complaints that studies of effectiveness of COVID vaccines are being compromised because many in the control groups are getting vaccinated after the original study completed. Hmm. Um, I, I don't know actually about that, nor, nor exactly. Uh, I'm not sure if it means that they're getting vaccinated so they're no longer a control. Maybe that's that's the idea. It's it's a moving target, right? As, as more population gets uh, vaccinated, things will automatically change, right? So you always have to have your controls uh, along the way. You can't use historical controls because the situation was different at the time because there were less people uh, there. That's why a control group must be identical to the treated group except for the variable of interest. So you have to always run them concurrently. You can't have run them the month, month before, the week before, or what have you, always at the same time. Does knowledge of types of biases actually make us less vulnerable to them? A little bit. A little bit. Except we all think they don't apply to us, but. This is a question that someone asked that, what do you think about published data by country in total cumulative numbers instead of rates? 
does someone want to go? Because that, that's something I wondered a lot myself too. I mean, I think both are important because I think it's important, especially in the case of something like if we're talking about deaths, you know, it's, it's important to pay attention to the rate in which this is happening and thinking about that, how it's affecting that overall population, but also just thinking about total counts seems really important as well to just think about the humanity of the count of people, you know, the number of lives that are being affected. So I think it's actually important often to do both um, rather than just publish a single uh, variable. I think it's always best to give just more pieces of information so people can kind of put these numbers in context, both the percentage and the overall count, that's my opinion. Yeah, I agree. And I think that when you're thinking about something like that, it's really important that you check these cumulative numbers and make sure that they've been normalized by the population of each country that's reporting. Because if it's just raw, you know, say number of people in the United States who have died from COVID, that number is going to be a lot, lot higher than that number, say in Costa Rica. So you've got to have some sort of mechanism in your analysis that accounts for that. I'm mute. Sorry. Uh, what tools can we use to fight preconceptions or labeling bias? That's really hard. Um, I, I remember reading a study about um, teachers looking at children, and they were told that one ch child was a bully and the other and the other one wasn't. And there were two children, one black, one white. And then they measured the eye tracking of the teachers. And guess what? The teacher constantly kept looking at the black kid. And, and therefore had then, whenever the black kid did something, had confirmation bias, perhaps that the kid was doing something wrong. And this even happened when black teachers were put in that position. So it was a real bias and it's, it's really hard. So in science, we can be what's called blind to the experimental conditions, both when we analyze the data and when we run the experiment, we shouldn't know who's treated with, with what. But sometimes it's hard. Like if you study age, you know, you have a small, uh, animal and a big animal, <laughs> if you say you're sexist, they look different, you know? So it's hard to, to be blind, but you should be as blind as possible, especially in the data analysis. Um, I do recommend watching um, some TED Talks by Dan Ariely. He explains it quite well, how there are biases in this, and it really leads you to want to cherry pick and exclude uh, the data. And we had another great question. Um, the Predictably Irrational book is by Dan Ariely. Yeah. Uh, would you say culture impacts skepticism a lot or is it the only thing that can change what a person might be skeptical of? You know, I don't know. Dan Ariely says that when he did studies in Italy and stuff like that, everybody cheated a little bit. That's not skepticism, but still he, he found similarities. I know that... Um, being born and raised in Italy, I'm skeptical of everything. I don't trust anyone. <laughs> so I know it has affected me, but that's an anecdotal thing. So obviously an anecdote is, is not uh, data. I, I think there are uh, some uh, biases uh, of some sorts, but I don't know which ones. I know the ones that I feel personally, but it's just, again, uh, my own experience. see what other questions we have. Given that most of the decisions we have to make are based on incomplete or flawed data, any practical recommendations for us to balance our own biases and still trust our intuition? <laughs> I, 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 I would say don't trust your intuition. <laughs> um, catalog things, you, you know, even in the lab, right? We always run experiments the same way. We always start something at seven o'clock in the morning and we can really swear that that's what we do. And then we go look at our notes and it's not true at all. So what we remember is really different. So um, 
I would not trust your intuition. Cataloging is a good thing, but then you have to know how to analyze the data. So it's, it becomes a hassle. I think just being aware that there are these things um, is, is at least helpful. I was gonna add too, to know when a, a source is trustworthy or not. So, you know, there, I, I know my own limitations and that I'm not gonna find out everything there is to know. Um, say about like vaccine safety. So I went to people who I know are experts on that and I asked them what they thought, um, you know? And so I think, you know, sometimes just knowing your own limitations is it's okay, but also knowing where to get valid opinions about the data from people who've actually spent a lot of time thinking about it is good as well. Um, there's another one. Basically, the more you can remove people from the process, the more you remove biases, the better the process. To some extent, that's true. On the other hand, you could also use these other people as, as checks, you know, checks and balances. Uh, so it depends. Um, unfortunately, though, I agree that the, the common person nowadays is kind of lazy to go back and look at this stuff. We are soundbite people right now. So uh, maybe in that respect, uh, I agree, the fewer the better. All right, folks, sorry to barge in, but it's the witching hour. So uh, I want to thank you guys so much. And this is the this is one of the crummy parts of the virtual thing is you don't get to hear the big applause that you deserve, but we, we want to give it to you guys anyway. So thank you so much. Thank you. I want to mention one thing. So scientists do automate things. There's the there's a famous anecdote about how two labs kept getting doing the same experiment and getting opposite results, and they did things and then they finally literally did this experiment side by side and they continue to get opposite results until somebody realized that one group liked to pick one the bigger routes and one like group liked to pick the smaller routes and so we learned to do things like let a random number generator assign the routes to the groups because you never know so that's a way to automate things you never know when uh things are coming but anyway you guys did wonderful thank you so much um i'm uh, um Again, it's a shame that you can't hear uh, the applause, but uh, it's happening. I'm getting lots of texts about how good it was, so thank you for that. So uh, just as a, as a way to close out, I want to um, share this with you. So uh, just a, a reminder uh, that the next Brainstorms is March 25th. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, I want to remind again, here's my email address. If you didn't get a question answered or you think of one later, email me. Uh, if I don't know the answer, I will find somebody like Mickey or our panelists who do. Uh, just another reminder that you can see previous brainstorms by going to utbrainstorms.com and we have all of the previous, all of them that were uh, recorded on video, there are links to those recordings. Uh, there you can also see the upcoming ones. Uh, final thing about March 25th, it's gonna be connected in, in, a, in a way to the annual UT 40 for 40 fundraising event. It's gonna be an opportunity for us to get a little notoriety and, uh, and uh, ask for help uh, fundraising. So we look forward to that. But more than anything, I just wanna thank Mickey and the panelists once again for a great job. Thank uh, all of our loyal followers for being here. And if you're a new time, uh, a first timer, thank you for that too. Hope to see you again. And as we always say, we'll, we'll keep doing these as long as people show up and find it interesting. And so thank you so much for that support. Uh, be safe and hope to see you on March 25th. Uh, good night.